It is Wednesday afternoon, November 1st. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 28. We'll pick up verse by verse, approximately verse 10, but we'll back up for a quick little overview, considering the fact that we missed last week. So any of you who are going to the archives and looking for the end of October, um, 24th approximately, yeah, or maybe 25th. Sorry, there was no class due to allergy, but we are back and uh, hopefully clear enough that the recording is good. So in chapter 28, we saw that Yitzhak, the father of Yaakov, Jacob, blessed him finally the way he was supposed to bless him initially when he was receiving the blessing that goes along with the birthright. Now he finally is doing it right. He's going to be sending his son out because his son is not to take a wife from among those in Canaan, the area where they're living, because they are um, heathen, they are idolatrous, and it's very important that the one who's carrying on that will build down toward the seed that we call Messiah, Galatians 3.16 tells us the seed is Messiah, that it needs to be a spiritual line that is kept it's spiritually pure, that will bring forth this seed in time. We know it's going to be a long time. They didn't know. They thought it could be, you know, right away in their generation even. So it's important that he pick um, the right wife. Isaac had his father do that for him. Abram sent the servant back home to draw from the family that was believers to bring a godly wife to Yitzhak. That's how he got Rivka, Rebecca. He should have done that for his son Yaakov. He did not but he is going to send his son to go back. And so that he tells him to go back to the area that came from Padan Aram, or Aram, that's the, the area of Mesopotamia, it means the tableland of Aram, or the Aram of the two rivers, which would be the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, um, where they, they live from. And he was to get a wife from the daughters of Levon. You call him Laban. That's a cousin in the family. So. Uh, back in this time, they could marry close relatives, and, and he's telling them that God Almighty, in verse 3, El Shaddai, the nourisher, the nurturer, the provider, the sustainer, the satisfier, uh, did I say the supplier, all of these in the meaning behind El Shaddai. This is the, the breasted one. We see the fruit of the breast, feeding, the, the fruit of the womb that, that brings forth life. We see every need being met. And we also see on the flip side in that name that it also means to overpower or to destroy both of these out of the root that make the word Shaddai. So we have the one who is able to subdue all things unto himself, that's our God, who is able to deliver from all enemies, that's our God. And I encourage Israel today, look to your God because your God can protect you and bring you safely uh, free from all your enemies. This is the one who also will nourish, will satisfy, and will supply. All of that packed into the name El Shaddai that we're reminded of in verse 3. What a rich, rich verse. So Yaakov, you're going to go out with the blessing of El Shaddai on you. May God Almighty bless you, make you fruitful, multiply you, so you become a multitude of peoples. May he give you the blessing of Abraham to you, to your descendants with you, so that you'll possess the land where you live as a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Yitzhak is acknowledging God gave this land to Abraham. And even though, Yaakov, I'm sending you back to get a wife, I'm praying blessing over you in the land. He did not expect his son to go and stay forever. The son would come back. This land is a land that God promised to Abraham, God promised to Yitzhak, and God promised to Yaakov. They were promised in that blessing a land, a nation, and a people. Uh, a blessing. Did I say that? People. The three. Sorry. There goes my brain again. Sorry, folks. Anyway, we'll see it as, as it's unfolded and given again to, to Yaakov, so I won't stress the point at this juncture. But uh, it, it, just that God was going with him. I do stress that because I hear so much negativity that Jacob had to go out. It was his fault. Now he's cast out of the land and he's going under judgment. It's the same way they say he's a deceiver. He deceived. He got what he deserved. Really? Really? Well, let's see how God deals with Jacob. Does God send him out in judgment? Does God cast him out? Does, does God say, you blew it, you're on your own now? 
or do we see God's blessing on him, on his journey, and the purpose for his journey? Just little hints that I'm dropping out, little seeds that we will see come to a full point in um, as we go on through this chapter. Sorry, folks, we got interference outside from machinery. So I closed the door. <laughs> Hopefully that will help. We've still got windows open, but the door is a big window. <laughs> okay, so he's to go to Levant to the brother of Rivka. The brother of, he's, he's to go to Uncle Levant, okay? His mom's brother. Um, and it does describe him as an Aramean or as a Syrian. That's the same thing, same description, Avraham, because again, they're going back to that area. Does not mean Syria that we see on the map today above Israel. This is going back to where the Tigris and the Euphrates were to that area, or the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, all in that area. Isaac disappears off of the scene now. We have nothing more recorded of him until his death. That's about 43 to 45 years later. So Yitzhak had a great beginning, great picture of our Savior in his miraculous birth, in his near sacrifice of himself. Um, but then we see his humanity in not following God's will, wanting to bless his other son. God didn't let it happen, brought him up short. He realizes, turns around, and does bless the, the way he should. But uh, again, it's just that we see the humanness of those in our Bible, and that encourages us because we're not going to get everything perfect. But if God was willing to keep using them, then I think God's willing to keep using us. So let it encourage you. We notice that Esau, the unchosen, marries in the unchosen line. Jacob, the chosen, will marry in the chosen line. Um, so Esau goes on and adds two more wives trying to appease his parents, but again, um, they were related to Abraham, related to his grandfather, but they were not in that godly line. So picking up with that background, we're at verse 10. Yaakov is departing now. He left Beersheba and he went toward Haran. That's heading back toward um, where he will go back to Uncle Levant, to where his family is, his relatives are. We saw last week, or two weeks ago, so I won't go into the detail, but that he is probably 75 to 76 years old. We tend to want to think of him because we know what's going to happen to him, that he's in his 20s, and he's not. He's 75, 76 years old. He's about halfway through his life, okay? Uh, I think I gave you everything I need to there in the background. Verse 11 tells us he came to a certain place. Now, the way that the Hebrew says it, it is a designated place. It is the place. This was not by accident. He was directed here by God. So, number one, how do we know that he's going out with God's blessing? How did Avram come to the, the land of Israel? Did he have a road map and he knew God said, you're over here and I want you over here. Now, now go and figure it out for yourself. <laughs> no. We know that God led Avram every step of the way. All he said to Avram was, go and I'll show. Didn't even promise it to him at that point. But go to a land, I'll show you. Avram followed God day by day. He ends up in the land that God eventually says, Avram, this is your land. This is for you and for your children after you. Yaakov is going out in that same way and with that same kind of faith. He is trusting his God in heaven. He is going to go to the place that God directed him. He stops at Bethel, Bethel, house of God, originally called Luz, L-U-Z. It's about 12 miles north of Jerusalem. That makes it, and don't miss this, about a three days journey from Beersheba. Everybody thinks he went out, and what we're going to talk about, his famous dream that happened on the first night, boom, Right out of the gate, here's what happened. But no, this was close to 60 miles. This would have been a three-day journey. A, a day's journey was considered about 20 miles. So this is an area in chapter um, 12. Avram built an altar here. This was a place where God met Avram, okay? Um, I think I've given you the verses before. If I haven't, 
we know when he went out from Beersheba, Beersheba is where Isaac dwelt with the wells and all of that. We saw that in chapter 21, verse 33, and we knew that was south of Jerusalem from chapter 22, verses 2 and 4, just in case if you're wondering how I get my facts. They're all out of the Word of God, and if you're looking for those cross-references and get them via email, I sent a whole lot late last night, so go check and you'll have them if you didn't notice already. So, as I mentioned, this wasn't his first night out, it wasn't his second night out, it was his third night out. And that's an excellent point to bring out because we see third day in scripture significant. Israel is three days out of her home when God reveals to her, reveals himself to her in the Messiah. Let me show you Hosea 6 um, verses 1 and 2. Hoshea, Hosea, Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. Come, let's return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Basically, he's allowed consequences to bring them where they're hurting and where they're needing healing. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day, that we may live before him. So let's learn, let's press on to know the Lord. So the third day, Israel's going to finally realize and turn to her Lord, and he's going to be able to heal her. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. We get that from Second Kepha, Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. We know that we are in the third day now. We're coming into the third day. We've got approximately 2,000 years since Messiah walked on this earth in that third day of resurrection power, of coming to know who her God is. We see the restoration of Israel in her third day. Jacob is going to be a picture of this with his third day. Third day out, God's going to show him something very significant, and it will stand really for all of Israel. You'll see that as we go on. So going back to um, Genesis, did I ruin my tab? I did, and I thought I got to the next one. Okay, I got it back. Sorry, folks. <laughs> back in um, verse 11, we have it happened upon a particular place. A certain place actually is the certain place. We saw um, that that's Beit El, um, where Avram had built an altar before. He spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and made it a support for his head and lay down in that place. Okay, he used a stone for a pillow and everybody says, see, judgment, poor guy's got a hard pillow. Well, hello, they didn't have RVs to camp in in those days. They were Bedouin lifestyles. They were used to the outdoors. He probably found a smooth type stone. He would have put down, you know, something he was wearing um, which would double as warmth, it would be a blanket, it would be everything that's needed, he would have made that like his pillow. But this was not, and his cloak is what I'm trying to call it, that was not unnecessarily foreign for him. It's more important that we realize that he went to sleep. And the idea in the word, the Hebrew word, vayishkav, means, and he lay down to sleep. Um, it comes from the, the root of Shekhov, and that again means to lie down. And what we're seeing that is not exact, but it's, it's, it's hinting toward that this is a type of death. Now, I do not mean that Yaakov died. He did not. But in his sleep, it was a picture, a type of death. What we're seeing is Yaakov was dead in his trespasses and sins, just like anyone is who needs to come to saving faith in Yeshua. He is helpless at this point. He's prostrate, prostrate before God. And that's a beautiful picture of Israel. Israel is the nation that when she's out of the land, she is out of that fellowship. And during this age called the Age of Grace, even though Israel has miraculously been brought back into the land, we know Hezekiel, Ezekiel 37 says, She's like dead bones. There's no spirit in her. There's no life in her. That's where she's at right now. So this picture of Jacob sleeping like a death is a picture of Israel in her sleep that needs to be awakened spiritually. That's what we're drawing from here. 
Go with me to Hezekiel, the, what I just mentioned, Ezekiel chapter 37. And we'll look at verses 4 and 5 to start and a few other verses in that chapter. Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> verses 4 and 5. And here we read, again he said to me, this is God speaking to Hezekiel, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Adonai Elohim, to these bones, Behold, hello, are you here again? Did you wake up? Don't miss it. Behold, Behold. I will cause breath to enter to you that you may come to life. Okay? God's going to bring them to life. Verses 11 through 14. Then he, God, said to me, Hezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is perished, we are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. Hallelujah. And I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, has spoken and done it, declares the Lord. How can you not say hallelujah to that? Especially with what's going on right now, so against Israel, wanting to annihilate Israel. Yes, she's back in the land, not fully because there are Jews scattered to the ends of the earth still, but she is those dry bones that God is saying, I'm going to pour my spirit into those dry bones, bring them back to life. You will know I am your God. You will be my people. I will put you in the land of Israel and you will worship me. You will know. Oh, hallelujah. There's Israel's future, everyone. Loud and clear, the land is not going to go to the, their countries, to the enemies of Israel. The land will be Israel, the Jewish land for the Jewish people. God will bring them back from the four corners of the earth, his spirit in them, because they have finally awakened and cried out, looked to their God and said, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're finally looking to their Lord to redeem them as they finally did in Egypt when they cried out in slavery and God redeemed them. Yes, it will get worse for Israel before they do that, but hallelujah, that is the coming picture. So what a beautiful picture back with Yaakov, back in Genesis, uh, that he is a picture of this slumber, this, this um, like death, but he's going to awaken to a beautiful future. Before Yaakov awakens, he's going to be shown in this picture in a beautiful, beautiful way. We're going to be talking about Jacob's ladder. That's what it's commonly called. But if you get my text for class day, I already raised the question to get you thinking, whose ladder is it? Why do we call it Jacob's ladder? Let's see whose ladder it is. It was God's ladder. <laughs> The angels were dancing. You think, Loretta? <laughs> Have you read ahead? <laughs> okay, so we are in verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he had a dream, okay? I think we all dream at night, but Yaakov has one that gets recorded. This is important for us. Behold, are you awake? Don't miss it. Remember, that's what behold means in Scripture. Wake up, realize, grab hold of this. Behold. And I lost my place. There we go. Behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Okay. Now, notice this ladder reaches from heaven to earth. Okay? It's starting in heaven. It's reaching down to earth. Because this is going to be a picture of God saving helpless man. Yochanan, John 14, 6, Yeshua Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So if this ladder is showing the way from heaven to earth for man to get right with God in heaven, then what is it picturing? Or better yet, I should say, who is it picturing? He spanned the infinite gulf from, that separated heaven from earth 
and he is the complete provision. Nothing else is needed. He's the way. He's the mediator between God and man. That's 1 Timothy 2, 5. And the only way to have fellowship with God is to come through the way. It's to, in essence, climb this ladder, I'll say in that way. So we see that this ladder is symbolizing the redemptive promise of God. God is showing Jacob how he can go to heaven. God is showing Jacob how he can have relationship with his God in heaven. God is, is filling the gap between heaven and Jacob. And it's a picture for all of Israel to see because Jacob is representing Israel. When it says in the King James set up on the earth or set on the earth, it's on earth that the work of salvation was done. That Yeshua came down to earth, lived on this earth, a human life to redeem human mankind. Reaching to heaven again, that's the means of communication between heaven and earth. And the angels that we see going up and down were ministering servants, ministering spirits to the saints. Okay, to those who are believers. Hebrews 1.4 tells us that, that the angels are ministering to those who are receiving salvation. So the ascending and the descending shows that they are coming from heaven, going down to earth, carrying out whatever assignment God has given them, and then they're going back up to heaven, and they're coming down again with another assignment, and they're going on. This has been going on all along. What God is showing Yaakov is, you haven't been alone. You're not alone now. You won't be alone in the future. And he is assuring Yaakov of God's continual help on his behalf because he is helpless. Remember, he's laying flat, prostrate before God as if in a stupor of death. But God is saying, I will help you. I have my angels ministering to you. I have been with you. And furthermore, most important, is I bridged the gap from heaven to earth. How did Yeshua bridge the gap? He did it with his own body. That's what the ladder really is. Make that ladder in the shape of a cross. See his shed blood, and you've got what that ladder really is all about. As we go on, verse 13 says, Then behold, again, emphasize how important, the Lord was standing above it, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the land which you, on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Wow. I would like a whole lot of people in this world today to read that one verse. <laughs> and remember, this world was created by God, this world is kept by God, and this world is acting in accordance with how God's plan will be carried out, even when they don't know it. They play into God's hand. Not that God does the evil, but he uses the bad and the good to serve his purpose. And God is declaring very clearly, the name used here is Jehovah. Remember when he uses that name, he's saying, I am the self-existent one. I need no one else. I exist totally of myself. I'm the one who reveals myself, and I'm revealing myself in a redemptive plan with mankind. That's what's meant by the name Jehovah. So God is telling Yaakov, I have everything you need, I am everything you need, I am even your salvation. And that's the special relationship that God has with man. But then he didn't even just stop there, he says, I am the Lord God, I am Jehovah Elohim. And that word Elohim, again, from our Hebrew, reminds Yaakov, I am the strong one who is faithful. What more could Yaakov want or need? Everything is in the name. I am the Lord God. I am the one redeeming you. I'm the one who will save you. I am the one who has, is strong. I am the one who is faithful. Everything Yaakov needs. Now, if Yaakov was under God's judgment at this time, God would be correcting him. God would be instructing him, you need to do this, you need to do that. Remember when God pulled Avram up short? Is what are you doing down in Egypt? What are you doing with a, a, the king of the land, taking, letting have your wife? You know, he brought him under correction. We don't see that here. 
Again, I'm not saying everything Jacob did was right, but God is not judging him as if he's rebellious, as if he's out of line. I really think that what he did, he thought the end is justifying the means. He knew it was God's will for him to receive that blessing, and he moved in accordance with that. God is assuring him, you haven't lost it. The blessing is upon you. I am accomplishing what I had planned with you, through you, always. And that's what he is saying. I'm your covenant-keeping God. I have a relationship with you. I'm able to perform everything I say. And he met Jacob in such a real personal way that this is life-changing to Jacob. This is going to help him not rely on himself the next time he's in a hard place, but he's going to stop and think, wait a minute, before I take things into my own hands, let me rely on my God, who is faithful, who is strong, who is able, who has promised, and who has met me here. So, wow, what, what we get, what Jacob got, I mean, this was an awesome, awesome dream. I had a dream last night, it was anything but awesome. <laughs> I'd love to have this kind of a dream. So, I'm the Lord your God, of your father Abraham. The, and the God of Yitzhak. Here we see again, he's reminding him, what was promised to Avraham, I'm faithful to complete it. What's promised to Yitzhak, I'm faithful to complete it. I'm the same God you saw and you heard how I, I helped your grandfather, how I helped your father. I am here with you. And he makes this promise now specifically. The confirmation of the Avrahamic covenant now goes to Jacob. That's why I said earlier I wouldn't try to do it in detail because it is here. Okay, before um, Yitzhak had told Jacob about the covenant, uh, in chapter 28, verses 3 and 4, we saw that. When he's giving him the blessing, he's bringing to his mind, this is what God has promised. This is our covenant. This is the covenant God made with Avraham. But now, now it's the voice of God. And it's the voice of God himself who's confirming it. God is promising Jacob a lamp and a blessing. It's, it's God repeating the same terms of the covenant that he gave to Abraham in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. He gave to Isaac in chapter 26, verses 2 to 5. Now in chapter 28 here, in verse 13 and following, he is giving the same promise to Jacob. That's why we say, who does this land belong to? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. In that line, yes, Ishmael is the grandson of Abraham. Sorry, he's the son of Abraham. But he's not the promised son. He's not Isaac. Yes, his son Esau is Jacob's twin brother, but he was not the promised son. It was Jacob. God had said, the younger. So God is following through faithfully in his word. It has now been promised from Abraham to Isaac's line, to Jacob's line, and it will go on until we come all the way down to Messiah in that line. The other line gets blessing also, but not this blessing and not this promise of a land, a nation, a people, and God being their God. I just, I have to call it exactly how God called it in the scriptures and any who want to argue with it i tell you take your argument up with god because he made this world he made the rules when you make your world and your rules you can be god over it but sorry folks he gets the final word the first word and the last word so let's get specific verse 14 your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth you will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay, dust, the dust of the earth. Dust can be scattered by the wind. Dust just flies and goes everywhere. And that's even significant because Israel would be scattered because of her sin. Israel stayed in the land in obedience. When Israel was disobedient, she would get thrust out of the land. She has been scattered. She is still scattered to the ends of the earth. We know that there are Jews everywhere. I don't think you can go to any nation and not find a Jew living in that nation because they've been scattered like the dust. Spread out, spread abroad, whatever your, your version says. Uh, mine says spread out. 
it probably means um, directly as covering all of the promised land. They'd be spread out through the promised land, but they're going to be spread out beyond the promised land. Now notice the change here from Avraham. We don't have any mention of the stars of heaven as God had said to Avraham, that they'd be like the, you know, the sand on the, the shore, but also like the stars of the heaven. The dust is speaking to the physical, the earth. The sand was also speaking to the physical. The stars was speaking the spiritual. And in the stars, Abraham saw the day of Yeshua, believed, and faith was given to him or was counted to him for righteousness. But the dust of the earth is saying physical. This is, Jacob, you will be a large family. Out of your family will come physical seed. And he's promised to be the progenitor of a large physical race. That's why there's so much. The stars of heaven are going to speak of the spiritual seed that God promised Avram. But he didn't promise that part to Jacob. So really, all of the saved people can say they're of the spiritual seed of Avraham. And that's what they are called, even in Galatians 3.29. Let's look at that real quick. Because again, this is a little bit of a misnomer spoken today by a lot of people. I know their heart, I know what they mean, but if we want to be accurate, Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So what God is saying, Abraham has been promised a spiritual family, believers through his family who believe in Christ. If you're one of those who believe in Christ, then you're a spiritual descendant of Abraham and heirs according to the spiritual promise. So all can say that they're saved, that they're of the spiritual seed of Abraham. What they can't say is that they're a spiritual seed of Jacob, because that's not what was said to Jacob. That means, and I don't mean to step on toes, because I understand the heart, but that means that if you are... Um, a Gentile believer, you didn't become a, a Jew because Abraham wasn't a Jew. We talked about that just before this class started. So I hear those that say, well, oh, my father's Abraham, so I'm a spiritual Jew. Well, if Abraham wasn't a spiritual Jew, how does your connection to Abraham make you a spiritual Jew? <laughs> okay? <laughs> you are a wonderful, beloved, spiritual Gentile. And there's not a thing wrong with that. It's not second choice, not second class, not a step down. It's an equality. We are one in Yeshua. So please realize that, that and understand that. But you can't call yourself a spiritual Jew because your father is Abraham, because your father wasn't a Jew. What did you say we were? A spiritual Gentile. Oh, Gentile. Spiritual Gentile. Oh yeah, so it, it's just just to keep the line straight and understanding that in our age of grace, in the body of Messiah, of Yeshua, of Jesus, of Christ, whatever word you understand best, because all those words are, are the one person, the Son of God, the very God himself, we're all one. Ephesians 2 talks about it very clearly, that there are those who were of the, the seed, the Jewish seed, that had the truth that you had to use to come into those ways, be obedient to that law to show that you believed in the one true and living God of Israel for salvation. But God broke down that middle wall, and now Gentile and Jew came in on equal footing. Both came to the foot of the cross. Both are saved through the cross of Yeshua Jesus, and that's what gives salvation to each, whether they're Jewish or they're Gentile. They come through the blood of Yeshua. They come through the ladder that we're seeing that God has pictured um, to Yaakov because that ladder really is the Messiah. So God's not saying you change who you were. You become a saved version of who you were. So if you were born Gentile, sorry, but you're still Gentile. And I only say sorry because of those who don't like that. I don't think there's a thing wrong with that. I think it's wonderful to be a saved Gentile. Those who were Jewish are saved Jews when they come to faith. You can't cross those lines. That's all that, that's being said. So, yes, you're of the spiritual seed of Abraham, but that doesn't make you a physical Jew, okay? Just facts, folks, because I, I hear it 
I hear too much said the wrong way. But again, please, please realize there's no, uh, God doesn't even have grandchildren. He has children. And he loves variety. And he loves his Gentile children just as much as he loves his Jewish children and vice versa. Okay, we are back in, I think it's verse 15. Yeah, the dust of the earth was 14 spread out every direction, west, east, north, south, in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay, through the descendants of Jacob, of what is Israel, there will be blessing to all the families of the earth. Now, I'll ask you, how is that possible? All the families of the earth. Very simple answer. In Yeshua, in Jesus, he is a descendant of Jacob's progeny. That's why it's saying that through him, through his family, all the earth would be blessed. No one can bless this whole earth except Yeshua Jesus. First and greatest way of blessing is salvation. Later we see other blessings. We see during the millennium all the nations come up and receive blessing. They go back to their nations and their nations are blessed. But they're blessed specifically through the Savior who came through Jacob's line, who is the seed. That's what's being said. Now, there's a smaller way that the Jew is blessed in every field, medical, science, etc., and those blessings do cover everybody. The polio vaccine doesn't just help Jewish children, it helped Jewish and Gentile children. And I could go to a million examples of what the Jew has brought to the world. That's smaller blessings, but that's true also because God wanted to bless the nations through the Jew. And again, when they come up into Israel in the millennium, they'll be blessed in their ways in their nations also. But the greatest, the most important, and the singular when we hit it is through the Jewish Messiah, through the son of Jacob, the seed of Jacob, I should say. And that's how all the families are blessed. So everybody has the opening and possibility to that blessing. And that, again, is beautiful. God went on and promised him, verse 15, another time we hear the word, Behold! <laughs> I want to see you wake up. I don't want to see you miss this, okay? It's important. And he's making sure Jacob's getting it. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Wow. Okay? God is telling him everything. He, again, he's, I don't see judgment here. I don't see him say like he did to Abraham, what are you doing out of the land? Get back to Egypt, from Egypt, get back to, to the land of promise. Remember, Isaac was told, stay in the land of promise. Jacob, on the contrary, is being told, I'm with you wherever you go, and I will bring you back. Jacob, you're going to come home. That's being signed, sealed, and as good as delivered. When it says, I will keep you, the Hebrew gives us the idea, I will guard you. He is going out into a world that's not going to be friendly to him. God is with him. He's going to bring him back to this land again, back to the land of promise, back to the land of the covenant. He will not leave. The Hebrew word is, won't well, forsake, until I have done. Now that fulfillment is going to be a long way off. It's probably about, well, it's definitely over 20 years, probably 21 to 22 years before Jacob comes home. So it's a long time. It might be why God was setting it down so hard and so strong is, make no mistake, Jacob, you're going on a long journey, but I'm with you, I'll keep you, and I'll bring you back home because I will fulfill everything I have promised you. Again, what can we draw from that personally? Let me tell you, in verses 13 to 15 right here, with God speaking to Jacob, he says over and over and over, I am. Okay, he says it in different ways. He says, I will give, I am with, I will keep, I will bring, I will not leave, I have done, I have promised, I have spoken. Seven times we've got an I am, an I have, I will, da-da. Okay, seven times I 
I, 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 I. Okay? I is God. I is Lord God. Yehovah Elohim. The God who deals in a redemptive way with man. The God who is faithful to covenant. The God who is strong and is faithful. All of this. This is what God is saying. He's telling him, I will complete. I will perfect my promise. He didn't say, Jacob, get it all right, do it right, and if you do, this is what you'll get, or this is what will happen. We come into God's promise, his covenant with us, his salvation, his promise to keep us, his promise to never forsake us, his promise to bring us into blessing. The same way Yaakov could walk in the strength of these words, we can walk in the strength of those words. I know I am saved. Am I standing in heaven? Do I have my eternal future in front of my face? No. My eyes can't see it, but I know it. I have no doubt. I have no reservation. I know that whether I go out of this world in murder, in sickness, in a car accident, or in rapture, hallelujah, However I go, I know where I'm going. I know it's signed, it's sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, and I know where I will spend all of my eternity. I am as sure of that as we're going to see Jacob receive what God had said. Give me long enough, I'll bring Jacob back home. <laughs> okay? It's going to be a few Wednesdays, but I will bring him back home. And one last thing that I will stress on this also is again, and I know I, I sound like the broken record, but I'm speaking against all those sermons that I hear again and again and again, okay? There's no word of rebuke to Jacob in here. There is not one word. There is only blessing and only promise. And I will say we should not make a moral judgment that God did not make. So all of those who take Jacob, call him the deceiver, use that wrong understanding of his name and use it against him and take it to the point, and yes, I've heard it even in my own lifetime, that's a Jew for you. They're deceivers, they're tricksters, and, and Jacob even is going to get tricked because he was one who tricked, so tit for tat. I am so thankful we don't have a God who is like that and a God who deals like that, and I don't see it, a word of that in it. In fact, if anything, I see the greatest a promise and a greatest blessing to Jacob, saving him, speaking to the eternal, and being with him, keeping him safe in the physical. That greatest blessing is I am with you. And this is what I want you to take home today. Also, God is with you. If you're his child, he is with you. I don't care how upside down your world is. I don't care how miserable how upset you are, how you think there's no way out of this, the deepest pit, God's deeper. It's not our circumstances, it's our God. He is faithful. He said, I am with you. That's present. Right here in chapter 20, verse 15, I am with you. In chapter 31 and verse 3, let's look real quickly, go to Genesis 31, 3. And in that, we see God promise in the future. Genesis 31, 3 says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So when it's time for Jacob to come home, God tells him it's time and says, I'll be with you. So God's promised to be with him in the present, promised to be with him in the future. God was with him in the past, verse 5 of chapter 31 and said to them, I see your father's attitude that is not friendly toward me as it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. So Jacob has said now, God has been with me, God is with me, God will be with me. That's passed down to all the generations that come. Look at chapter 48 and verse 21. Chapter 48 and verse 21 of Genesis, a bear sheet where we get our great beginning, Genesis 48 and verse 21, and we have there, Then Israel, Jacob, said to Yosef, his son, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you, 
and bring you back to the land of your fathers. This is when Jacob has gone down into Egypt. They were about 70 people went down because of the famine in the land. Joseph is on the throne right under Pharaoh and was able to supply for all the children of Israel. It goes good with them. Many years later, it turns bad for them. 400 plus years later, they get back finally to the promised land. The Genesis 48 and verse 21 is where God is telling his descendants that he would be with them. That, uh, and I've lost it, here it is, I will bring you back to the land of your fathers. So when they were in Egypt with Jacob, and we know it's going to be many years, but God promised it did happen. Israel came back under Moshe, led into the promised land with Yahshua. So God has promised every which way, I have been with you, I am with you, I will be with you, I promise to be with you. What an amazing God. And he gave that to Jacob and to Jacob's descendants. So I say to Israel, God is with you, God has been with you, God will be with you, and God has your future. And I say in the same way, because believers have come into the body of Christ, they're told that they are joint heirs with Messiah. That means that the promises for Messiah, they share in those promises. Messiah created the whole world, and God said, I've given it all to you. It's all under your feet. So God has promised you the same thing if you're his children through faith. He is with you. He has been with you. He will be with you. And your future is guaranteed. Hallelujah. Amen. What Amen. a picture. Amen. What a ladder between heaven and earth. And to see God himself standing at the top of that ladder. Don't take that lightly. What did Jacob see? I want to know what he saw. What a dream. So as we close this class today, back in 28, and I'm looking for a place to close it right now real quick. Um, verse 17, I just I want to explain it in the right way real quick. Um, verse 16, we've got to do 16. He has to wake up, okay? He's told him, I won't leave you till I've done all I promised. Then Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, The Lord is certainly in this place, and I didn't know it. We'll let that encourage you. That number, that That's we're back in chapter 28 and we're in verse 16. Okay, let that encourage you in your walk with the Lord. As I said, if you're in a dark place, you may fear where you're at. Jacob had no idea when he laid down his head in that picture of death, probably felt alone, probably felt the loneliness of the place. He's far from home. He didn't know God's presence was right there. But God revealed it to him very clearly. Don't go on your physical senses. Don't say God's not with me because I can't feel him. I can't see him. I can't hear him. No, walk it by faith and know God is there in the midst with you. And he is there to protect you, preserve you, bring you through. He is faithful. So, Yaakov, it says in verse 17, and why I can't stop and leave that out, because I don't want you to misunderstand it. It says, and he was afraid and said. Now, that's not afraid like we're saying, oh, I'm, I'm scared. You know, it, it, it might be the boogeyman. <laughs> no, this is Yaakov saying, I stand in the fear of my Lord. Ah, oh, I'm awestruck. I'm amazed how great my God is. If we get a glimpse of our God, we do fall in fear on our face before him, as Job, as Job, Job did, Job did, when he saw the greatness of his God. That's how any of us should respond. That's the right kind of fear. That's a reverential fear. And he said, how awesome is this place? Now, if you were scared to death of that place, you would not call it awesome. And you wouldn't go on and say, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Whoa. That gate is entrance into heaven. Yaakov saw that. I'm going to call it his launching pad. Here's where a rocket could launch off and land in heaven. That's not something that gave him, I'm afraid, I'm scared. No, that's a I standing. Ah, oh, I'm at the very entrance to heaven. His feet were on earth, but spiritually he saw right into the heavens. He knew he was in a great place. He was in the presence of his God. Wow, what a God, what a God of Jacob, what love, what promise, what security, what faithfulness, what strong one, what redemptive one, what 
have you to worry. Let me close it on that note for you. Let the God of Jacob encourage you. He is with you on your journey. He will keep you on his journey. He will bring you home in his perfect time. And all you need to say is, wow, hallelujah, and praise him and be humble before him and walk in the way he tells you to go. Whether you understand or not, Jacob, go. Abraham, go. Rochelle, go. Walk in the faith of your God. Can you imagine the very entrance into heaven? Short, short, short story, and I'll close in prayer. Um, several children were in a car that was hit by a drunk driver. They were coming back from the uh, ball game of their school. They were high schoolers, 16, 17 years old. True story. True story. Friends of mine. The car was hit head on by a, a drunk driver, and the driver loses his life in the car. The other kids survived, but the driver did lose his life. Someone was talking to his mom one day and saying, how could you drive down the street where your son was killed? And she looked at them and she said, oh, I love to drive down the street where Nathan lost his earthly life because that was his launching pad. He launched right into heaven from that location. She said, when I drive near there, I rejoice because my Nathan is alive in heaven. That's where God took him home. And that's how she saw it. I think that's beautiful, and I think that's what Jacob was saying. This is the gate to heaven. God is with you in that same way, no matter the circumstances. Did she not grieve as a mother for her son? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was not one bit of lack in her, that mother heart. But it found comfort in saying, no, that's where God launched him into heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Oh, our mighty God of Israel, we praise you. You are faithful. You are strong. You are in control. You are the mighty God of Israel. You are the God of our salvation. Your promise to Israel is true, and she will survive this war and every war till you bring an end to all the wars. Oh, how we can hardly wait for that day. But we thank you also as your children through faith that we have come through that ladder, which is your shed blood, that does bridge heaven to earth. How we thank you that we are in that same place. You are our God, that you are faithful, you are keeping us, you will keep us, and you will bring us home safely. Lord, help us not to fear what man might do to the physical body, but help us be strong in our faith, trust you, and know that to be absent from the body is simply to be present with you. Oh, how we look forward to that day. But until we're there, Lord, may we serve you by the power of your spirit. Give you praise and glory always. Shout our hallelujahs and thank you for who you are, the faithful God who keeps his promises, his word, who is faithful. Oh, praise you. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Amen. So when did that